um, phases of play. So, so or phase play, I should say, a little different from the phases I alluded to earlier, but how do the groups of the team flow together, exchange and intermix? This is the movement of the ball more than, you know, with the players, but, but the movement of the ball from the build-up phase into the preparation phase or from the preparation phase into the creation phase and so on, all the way up and then all the way down the field so that we have uh, a seamless transition as we move through the through the, the spaces in the field and the zones in the field. And our team understands that their roles, uh, there's a synergy within the roles of the defenders to the midfielders to the forwards as the ball is traveling through all of those spaces in the field. And then set pieces. So what are we doing when we win set pieces? How do we have, do we have a plan for how we plan to attack? And then also how do we work on defending set pieces? What can we do, you know, other than just making a wall and tracking and marking, but what can we do uh, defensively on set pieces to be organized uh, to ensure that we understand, you know, that we're matching for size, that we're making sure that our starting positions are good, that we understand what, you know, what, what players' roles are in those specific uh, situations and circumstances across the game. That's it. Any questions from anyone? So we, we kept this one short, guys, so that people could ask questions because we know that this is the most complex. So we'll go any direction people want to go. Yeah, yeah Jay. Jay. Sure. Uh, so can you uh, expand a little more on so the defensive side, right? Um, so the cues or pressing triggers, like what that means and, uh, you know, what those triggers can be? So, yeah, the cues to press are, you know, when we're looking at the opponent building out, um, one of the cues that I use to press is the first ball going sideways or backwards, okay? And, and that's a cue for the team to recognize and to step forward and to close spaces and, and create a predictable next pass for from the opponent. Um, and then from there, you're looking at a few different things. You're looking at, can you get pressure and get someone's head down? You're looking at, can you get them to turn their back to goal or force them along a barrier like the sideline? Can you, um, can you play off of a poor touch? Can you play off of a 50-50 ball? And so any of those moments are moments where you can press the ball, where you can, you can cue the team to press as long as your team has a plan and an organization behind it. Um, so th that's, where I would, that's where I would go when, when working on teaching um, how to press. Oftentimes I, I do it, especially in here with futsal, I do it based on that first pass out from the goalkeeper. How does that then trigger a sequence of movements that are going to make the game predictable for, the, for our team and allow us to control the opponent. Jeremy, um, on the pressing end of it, one of the things I don't think we address, and if I did, I missed it, is the um, compact of the lines. At times you see pressing high and then there's a gap in between. So also I think that was one of the things I like to do is when everybody's pressing together and compacting the field early and what cues you're looking for. Um, yeah, you're right. So, so, you know, when you press, it, it really is a cue for the entire team to understand what their role is. So, you know, it might be that the forward and the mid, the forwards and the midfielders are looking at, you know, setting an edge uh, to cut the field in half and sealing the edge to funnel the ball into your center midfield block. Those midfielders are looking to hunt the passing lanes and, and set the trap. But then the backs have a role as well. The outside back on the strong side is probably going to be supporting that midfielder as trying to seal the edge by taking away a forward pass, a direct forward pass. And then your center backs are looking to close the space in behind the midfield block to ensure that nothing gets played through the midfielders. But they also have to be leery of, of a ball played overhead. So they have to be, be alert to that as well. And then your weak sides are tucking in and enforcing the ball. So it's it's really the whole team is involved in any pressing moment. And, and you want to make sure that, you know, and, and when we talked, we talked a little bit, I think, last week on the 99 about the backs learning to recognize when to step and when to drop. And then also recognizing how to protect the space behind their backs and, in, uh, excuse me, behind them, the space behind the defenders, but also the space in front of the defenders so that this space between the defenders I often see it, and, and help me out if I'm if I'm wrong here. I often see that space biggest between the center backs and your center midfielders, where your forwards and your midfielders go, and your backs tend to sit deep. And so, 
you know, one of the things we can continue to work to, to train is to get those center backs at least one to squeeze into that space and kill some of that space so that um, the, the, the midfield block doesn't leave a zone of, of attack for a staging zone, so to speak, for the opponent if they break through that, that first line of pressure. And I think there's one piece to that too, Jeremy, is uh, the role of the goalkeeper too. You know, as you and I know, is it, you know, are you stepping into your out of your box now and, and playing sweeper keeper? You know, if anything comes over the back of that back four because the opposition's played direct because of pressing, yeah, the goalkeeper's going to be part of that that stepping and compressing as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and and um, again, relating that to what we're doing inside with futsal, I know you know some of the teams have a goalkeeper playing with them, some of the teams do not. And, it's, it's really a benefit to sometimes to the teams that do not have the goalkeeper, the recognized goalkeeper, uh, because when they win the ball, they can actually attack five on four and they have, you know, a fifth, a fifth field player on the field. Um, and for our goalkeepers, it's a great opportunity for them to start learning to build that skill, not just to deal with the space behind the defenders, but then also uh, work on their distribution in short and medium circumstances um, with some real consequences if it doesn't get sharp quickly. I think the only thing to add to inside of that pressing environment that we're uh, coaching on is the uh, first touch and the presentation to the ball of the player on the ball, right? And so if we don't have the proper level of pressure on the ball, then you're going to have a larger distance between your front to back inside of your team, right? And if we do have the appropriate amount of pressure on the ball, then you're going to be able to shrink that space. So when you guys are thinking about coaching it, a lot of it is the uh, primary attacker's position and relative ability on the ball, right? And that's that's what I'm coaching for, towards for my deeper lying players. Well, you're only playing with one, right? So that one is key to initiate that initial pressure. One striker, you mean? Yeah, when guiding our pressure. So we we're talking about the the extension of the last player being the striker, that, in my mind, is the guide to which side we're going to press and whether, who's going to get to the ball relatively to the position upfield. That's usually the first. That's usually the first visual cue. Yes, but I mean, there's yeah. Obviously, we we all see the the opportunity for other players to to be the trigger, exactly. but but that is when you're talking about a set circumstance. That's probably right. You know, that's more often than not the correct thought process there. Jeremy, do you use a specific cue to coach when those deeper players can step in front of their marks to cut into the passing lane? Uh, like yeah, pressure like on the only ball. if they're going negative or. I'm sorry. Say it again. Do you coach a uh, like specific cue for those deeper lying players to step in front of their marks if they're pressing? Like, um, yeah, rather than so, just marking. Yeah. So. Usually, what I what I talk about from a starting position is is the the deeper lying players, the the strikers and the and the um, excuse me the center backs that are dealing with the strikers and the midfielders, is to try to be on the ball side shoulder of the strikers so that they have a, a line of interception if they need to, and then pressure on the ball is going to dictate how aggressive they can be with what they're reading. So if I've got pressure on the ball and I've got the opposing outside back stays head down, we can be a little bit more aggressive about squeezing the space because, and, and looking to intercept because they're, they're not going to be making a well-informed decision under pressure. If we don't have pressure on the ball, then, you know, I, I encourage the, the players to get into a side on body position where they have the opportunity to go both forward if they recognize the pass coming into feet or uh, retreat back and recover over, to the ball over their head. So, it's really about the, the pressure on the ball and the time and space of the player with the ball from the opponent. And then from there, it's reading the cues of their body language. If they set the ball out too far in front of them and they look like they're going to hit it, uh, hit it big, that's when you start retreating. Uh, but you should really almost always be in that side on shape as a back line instead of being um, square or, or just looking for one specific thing. That's that's massively important. I couldn't agree with you more there. As far as the the footwork is almost the first thing that if with your back four that you need to work on, because that in those cases of dropping and shifting and, and stepping, but in those cases of dropping, the footwork is critical that they do that correctly. Because if not, 
you're talking about opportunities where you're square, you have to now make a complete 180 degree turn to retreat. Whereas sideways on dropping, dropping, uh, you know, it's 90 degrees, 45 degrees, and you can cut angles much better from there. But that'd be one of those first things that you work on, I think, when you're working with a, uh, if you have your idea who your back four is, is what what's the footwork looks like in those moments of reading, dropping? What's the footwork like in the moments of stepping and shifting? What's the role of the weak side back when you shift, you know? Are you open to be able to see everything? So I think that's, yeah, that's really, those are great points. It's massive. Yeah, body shape so, and footwork. At, at the highest levels, body shape and footwork matter so much because they give you those little advantages that, you know, when, when it's a step, when it's a step or a half a step to get to the ball first, if you have the right starting position and the right body shape, it, it gives you, you know, that little bit extra that you might need, you know, right. to, to so, be able to see it and get in there. Sorry, Jim, we, we got about one minute left. Can you, can you just quickly go through for the coaches? You have the phase of play. You have the individual group training within that environment. Not, not that one. Um, go further forward on the coaching. Uh, yeah. you're teaching within the system. Yeah. So can you just explain quickly how positional play would look in a training environment versus functional play versus phase play so that the coaches understand the differences? Sure. So, so I, I'll talk about positional play, functional play, and phase play specifically. The other, the other two, I think, are a little bit easier to figure out. And you um, have about a minute. Sorry. Yeah. So, <laughs> positional play. Positional play would be, um, for example, taking the the center backs and working with the center backs on the specific roles of their position, such as de developing a session that is really geared towards helping the center backs to recognize as Billy was talking about, recognize the cues of when to step versus when to drop, right? And so it would be, there would be other players involved, but the coaching is really centered around the center backs and the roles they have. When are they going to get side on? Uh, what cues are they looking for with pressure on the ball or not? What cues are they looking for? And then what's the response to those cues? Um, what does their body shape look like? And then again, if it breaks down, how quickly can we get back to the normal of pressing and covering as we would in a traditional defensive sense? Functional play would be a similar activity, but now not just the center backs, you'd also be talking about the role of the outside backs in there as well. Maybe even the holding midfielder as a shielding player. So now you're talking about a block of the team or a group of players within the team. And in a very similar situation to a positional play idea, you would be now be expanding your coaching to work on the entirety of that block. So um, using the same example, if there's no pressure on the ball, then the entire back line should be side on and their body shape should be so it should be such that they're all, you know, can kind of mirror each other. And then the ball is played, um, and the ball gets played over top. How are they dropping? How are they recycling possession? What do we do from there? Uh, what cues are they looking to recognize? What cues are they not looking to recognize? And then, um, and really positional play and functional play can be done in the same session in terms of starting with an idea like training the center backs. And then as you expand your numbers in the session, start expanding the coaching within the session. Um, phase play is uh, I typically use phase play more on the offensive side of the ball. So phase play would be like building from the middle third into the final third to create a scoring chance. So it might be uh, a possession related game in the middle third of the field to um, an entry pass to a defender that either has pressure or, or doesn't at first, um, and then give the team um, roles in their movements and their shape to get themselves in behind. So what we do a lot um, with our men's team at Southern is we'll play uh, a 4v4 game through the middle third of the field. We'll have two strikers against two center backs in the final third on either side, and the team who wins the ball is playing into one of their strikers. Once they've played into one of their strikers, two wingers join to make 4v2 in the, in the final third, and then they go to goal. So it's uh, how do you link the layers of the team to get yourself uh, from one portion of the field into another portion of the field. So building out could be, again, building out of the back to get into your midfield third, midfield third into the attacking third to create scoring chances, something like that. Cool, thanks. No All right, everybody. Uh, if you have individual questions, don't hesitate to reach out. You can get Jeremy, myself, any of the coaches that you think can support you as well. Um, I'd love to see more people interacting in that way. See you guys. Here, guys. Hey. Hey.